So now in the past couple of videos, we've been going over the fact that we have this ancestral protist that we all start from, and that can have this choice of whether or not we're going to develop true tissue or non-true tissue. And we covered the metazoans when we looked at periphera, and now we're focusing on the eumetazoans. Of the eumetazoans, we looked at the radiata, specifically cnidaria, who have radial symmetry, very simple organisms like jellyfish, coral, and sea anemone. Now we're focusing ourselves on bilateria more complex symmetry, bilateral symmetry specifically, and in the past couple of videos, more recently, we've looked at those that develop the mouth first. The mouth is the first opening, thus we sublabeled it protostomia. We're now going to change our focus from protostomia to the other side of the bilateria story, and that is those organisms that exhibit deuterostomia those organisms who classify themselves as deuterostomes. And deutero, if we remember, simply means second, and stomia would mean opening or mouth. So basic characteristics to remember about deuterostomia, which we'll do here, are the following. Just so that we have a good grounding of our knowledge um, from our previous lecture specifically. These guys, anybody who's deuterostomia, undergo radial and also indeterminate cleavage. Let's not forget those cleavage patterns. Now, that would mean that everything that we covered prior to this, which was a protostomia, would undergo spiral and determinant cleavage. Remember what those two mean and their prevalence and importance in terms of development of an organism. In addition to deuterostomia, we have to focus on the fact that the blastopore, that opening to that pouch cavity, that opening to the archenteron, will first become the anus. So it becomes the anus here and that's our first opening. That's why we have deuterostomia, which translates to second mouth, which, which would be the second opening that we see in these organisms. So, of these organisms, the one that's of importance to us, the phylum specifically in this video that's of importance, is the phylum Echinodermata. So it's spelled E-C-H-I-N-O-Dermata. D-D-E-R-M-A-T-A. In this phylum, we're going to have our, our classic example in this phylum would be anything that is of a, a sea star, something like a sea star, or a lot of people just refer to these as starfish. That's the more common name. Sea star is the more official name. And this is shown in figure 33.42. So take a look at figure 33.42 to get a better visualization of this type of organism. So, what is the story behind phylum Echinodermata? What makes this a phylum, a group of organisms? Well, this is the fact that they have a larval stage. Now, you might already be thinking, how can sea stars, which have a distinct five-sided you know, structure, five uh, extensions on them, exhibit bilateral symmetry? Wouldn't they have symmetry on all five sides if you cut them in the middle? And that's exactly right. But what we have to remember is that deuterostomia or bilateria, any of these characteristics means that at one point in their life, uh, whether it was in development or in their adult life cycle, they exhibit that characteristic. In the larval stage of Echinodermata, they exhibit bilateral symmetry. So the larvae exhibit bilateral symmetry. And that's all you need to be classified as a bilateria organism. Whereas if you move forward in the development of Echinodermata, let's say the adult stage, the classic sea star, starfish stage that you see any uh, old sea star or starfish, everybody has seen this before, or has a basic idea of what it looks like. And in this adult stage, it does not have the bilateral symmetry anymore. What it has actually in this time is a five-part body symmetry. And this five-part body symmetry is that classic starfish structure. And so this does not mean that it's not bilateral. It's the fact that at one point it was bilateral that allows it to be classified as bilateria. And of course, at one point it developed its mouth um, second. Now, in addition to the larval stage and adult stage, it's important to also understand the endoskeleton of this organism. We talked about exoskeleton when we looked at the arthropoda. We're now actually going to look at the endoskeleton, the skeleton within. And this is going to be, in other words, the internal skeleton. The endoskeleton here consists of calcium carbonate, 
So this is something that has been shown over and over and over again in many different organisms, phyla, different types of groups of organisms. It's very important to distinguish where calcium carbonate is seen and how it's seen. In phylum echinodermata, which are deuterostomes, which are bilateral organisms that are true tissue from the protist, they are seen within, not on the outside like the shells that we've seen thus far. This is actually within, on the inner skeleton. And then what we have from this calcium carbonate structure within are these spines that project outwards. These spine structures project outwards that give us that classic starfish shape. And that's specifically through the skin layer known as the epidermis. The outer layer of skin is the epidermis. And so we have this endo unique characteristic endoskeleton of the echinodermata. And finally, last characteristic to remember about these guys is that they have something known as a water vascular system. So a very specialized form uh, uh, that they use in order to feed and get, do their gas exchange. Specifically, when we look at this water vascular system, this is just fluid-filled canals and chambers. That's all it means. Fluid-filled canals plus chambers and that's within the structure of this echinodermata. Purpose of this is simple, in order to feed, so it's used in feeding, and it's also both of these things are used in gas exchange. Echinodermata need to breathe, they live in water, so they have to undergo some sort of gas exchange with the water that comes in through the water vascular system. And vascular just mean point of something to travel through, and things travel through this organism by these canals and chambers, and it's of course mediated by water, thus the name water vascular system. Finally, the, now that we've covered phylum echinodermata, we're going to sort of now complete this lecture by looking at one other very important large group of organisms that uh, a lot of people consider the most successful of all, which is the phylum chordata. Now, the phylum chordata is separate from echinodermata, but they are closely related in the sense that they are both deuterostomes. And so, what we're going to understand from this point forward is that things that are within phylum chordata actually can be invertebrates, something that we started our, this lecture off of, and they can also be vertebrates. There's no clear distinction between whether or not you're vertebrate or invertebrate in this phylum, and that's important to remember when you're looking at these uh, animals and these these groups of organisms, the idea of being an invertebrate or vertebrate is not something that a phylogeneticist would really truly care about because it's so paraphyletic and polyphyletic seen throughout the phylogenies, the evolutionary histories. It's just a characteristic to help us as students or classification scientists to understand what these organisms are and what they contain and what they don't contain. Phylum chordata contains both invertebrates and vertebrates. We're going to be concluding this lecture by looking at the many different types of uh, chordata animals and groups of animals seen within this larger deuterostome phylum.